So high quality georeference is one that allows us to measure not only, not only to put the dots on the map, but also to say something about the uncertainties associated with it, as if it were any kind of measurement. So one of the ways that we can describe a georeference, something's not quite right with the presentations, not at all showing up, is a bounding box method. And unfortunately, my bounding box doesn't show up here. The bounding box method provides a set of coordinates for each of the corners of a map. Let's say that this whole thing is the bounding box from here to here. So to describe the bounding box, we need two coordinates. We need the northwest corner and the southwest corner. That puts us in the neighborhood of this place called Davis in California. Okay? We're gonna put a box around it. So we're no longer putting a point. Our box contains the entirety of the town of Davis. So we have a measure of the spatial extent expressed as a bounding box. Unfortunately, my circle doesn't show up either, but there is another method to do this, and that is the point radius method, in which instead of putting the box around Davis, what we would do is we'd have a point in the center of Davis and a circle that surrounded all of Davis. Okay? You have to imagine, since it's not on my slide, a circle that goes all the way around Davis. So again, we're describing the spatial extent and we're using a method that has a circle to say that all of Davis is inside of here. Not a point, but a whole circle. The radius for that circle tells us something about how uncertain we are. The bigger the radius, the more uncertain we are. The smaller the radius, the more specific we are. So, a georeference that's very specific, one that comes from a GPS, would be a very small circle. The one that comes from georeferencing process, where the only thing that the, geo, the, the locality says is Davis, would have to be big enough to include the entire town. So those are two examples of high quality georeferencing methods, but there's one step further, and that is to do the best we possibly can. You'll imagine that, if I step back two steps to a bounding box method, you can imagine or see that if this was my box all the way around the outside, that my bounding box method includes plenty of things that are not Davis. There's all the area around. Even if I put my box from right here to right here, and right here, to right here. That's as small as I can make my box and include all of Davis, but there's stuff in the middle here that's not Davis, right? So, go back forward a bit again. An ideal georeference would be a georeference that allowed me to do all the spatial extent, but it leaves out the things that are not Davis. That is, to be able to do this as well as possible. So an example of that would be the shape method, where our shape, our polygon in this case, contains the town of Davis and nothing more. Okay? There is another way. This one is never used in practice so far but it's an interesting concept, and that's the probability method. So, on this side, we have a representation of the shape of a town called Hayfork. That's what the outline of that, that town looks like. It's a polygon. On this side, in shaded area here, you can see sort of the basic shape of Hayfork. It kind of looks the same has the same basic shape. But our description, our locality, is 20 miles east of Hayfork. So that being east, we're talking about locations that are centered here 
20, 20 miles in this case to the east. So the center of Hay Fork is there, go 20 miles to the east and you're here. The rest of it, the rest of all this shape takes into account the probability that that place is in that location. So right here in the center of Hay Fork, it's most likely, it's highest probabilities. But as you go toward the edges, it gets less and less likely. And it follows the shape of the original but it gets expanded because we're going something called east, but what does east mean? East might mean directly this way, or it might mean sort of this way, or sort of this way. We don't know. The collector has <coughs> not been specific enough. We'll get into details about it. So if I try to compare all of these methods and, and talk about two fundamental aspects of them, and that is, how easy are they to use, and how good are they? So the point method is quite easy to produce. Latitudes and longitudes, you just go to Google Maps, find out what the coordinate is at the center of the place. But there's no data quality associated with it. No user down the road can know how or whether to use that point, because they don't know how specific it is. The bounding box method is Fairly simple for spatial queries. You only need to know if it's greater than one and less than the other corner, except in strange cases around the international date line, where the latitudes and longitudes flip from 180 to minus 180 suddenly. That little location is a problem. But the rest is fairly easy to do spatial queries. But it's difficult to do quality assessment. You can't easily look at a bounding box and say how big it is. You have to kind of look. Let's see, the latitude goes from there to there. Oh, that's a whole degree. No, it takes time. You can't just look at one number, for example, and determine how specific a bounding box is. The point radius method is the opposite in terms of how difficult it is to determine. The this, um, sorry, start again. It's easy to determine the data quality because there's one single parameter that tells you. That single parameter is the coordinate uncertainty in meters. So I have a number in meters that tells me how big the circle is. So I can do a simple query that says, I would like all georeferences that have an uncertainty less than one kilometer because I'm going to use that, those uncertainties or those localities in an analysis like niche modeling where my environmental layers are at the resolution of one kilometer. I'm going to match my georeference data to my climate data, let's say. And I'll throw away all the ones where the circle is too big to make any sense. So that part is easy for a point radius method. The difficult part is to know, given a point and a radius, whether a location is inside the circle. It's easy with a bounding box. You look between the latitudes and longitudes. But it's not easy to find out if it's inside of a circle. That requires some serious mathematics. Then there's a shape method. The best thing about this is that it's an accurate representation of the place. And it only contains the parts that describe the place and nothing else, nothing extra. Remember, if we have a circle or a point radius, it can include the whole place, but it will include more than just the whole place. An extreme example of this would be a river. A circle to describe a place on the river is not very good because you're including all of the area to the sides of the river that aren't river. Shapes are complex. It requires, to use them requires GIS, a Geographic Information System. The other thing is that they are uniform. The probability everywhere inside of the shape is the same. You have no distinction of probabilities inside of it. As opposed to a probability method, which is also an accurate representation, it's also complex, and it has a non-uniform probability. All of the 
guidelines that you'll see in the most commonly used protocols for georeferencing use as its source this original document called the Manus Herpnet Ornus Guidelines. And when you get your quick reference guide, that quick, re quick reference guide is based on these protocols. And the long document, the book for georeferencing be best practices is also based on these same guidelines. So are all of the automated georeferencing tools. So this is fundamental. And it uses a point radius representation for georeferences. In it, the circle encompasses or circumscribes all sources of uncertainty about the location. That is to say this, if you have a circle that represents a locality, the locality is certainly inside the circle. There's very little chance that it's on the outside. Should be no chance that it's on the outside. These methods formalize the assumptions that have to be made. And we'll see what those are in later presentations. They document how to use the standards like Darwin Core. And the purpose of them is that if someone else does the georeference from the same location using those guidelines, they should up, end up with the same result. If they follow the same, the same rules, with the same inputs, they should have the same results. That's the goal. And then finally, those methods are user, usable universally. They work for marine <coughs> georeferencing. They work for georeferencing of fishes and rivers. They work for georeferencing of things that are non-biological. The rules are generic. But that's an important thing to understand. If the rules are generic and work for baskets as well as fish, then you have to believe that these methods are not taking into consideration anything about life histories or environments or species. In other words, these georeferencing methods are a first pass based only on the location information, not on the taxonomy. Okay? That's a very important point. So, that set of guidelines that I mentioned in the previous slide is what you would put into the Darwin Core term georeference protocol. This is where you would write the methods that were used. Specifically, you would say the Manus Herpnet Ornus guidelines or some other document that you, that you used, such as the georeferencing quick reference guide. That would be your georeference protocol. So I've described in brief what a georeference is or ought to be, so why should we do it? There are various benefits of being able to have trustworthy geographic coordinates, and those are to be able to map species locations and to know which of the points that constitute that map are well known and which are not. And that helps us to do things like understand species ranges, doing the process of georeferencing, whether it be with points and uncertainties or with shapes, allows us to do spatial analyses, which then allow us to combine our species occurrence data with other data that are in spatial form, such as environmental data and climate data. So basically what we have done then is to bring our biodiversity data into a domain where we can combine it with all kinds of information that are already spatially enabled. And that allows us to ask entirely new questions beyond things like morphology. So the sources of georeferencing information I've divided into two categories. One is where do the actual descriptions come from, the textual descriptions. And those would be off of labels, or out of field notes, or even out of published literature. That's where you'll find these textual locations written. The second category is where you'll find the information needed to turn the localities that are in text into the spatial form, into the latitudes, longitudes, and uncertainties. For that, we use gazetteers of place names and their coordinates. We use printed maps. And more and more often now, we use digital maps. 
So that's the full range of sources for georeferencing on both sides, where the text comes from and where the coordinates come from. So then most people, when they embark on a georeferencing endeavor, don't really have an idea of what they're getting into. Many will try to do it without ever having taken a georeferencing course, and they'll happily georeference their entire collection to latitudes and longitudes or something else and think that they're done. Well, if they're lucky, those things can be put on a map. If they're not so lucky, then they haven't only wasted their time and probably misinformed other people. So, when you undertake to georeference, there are several things to consider. One is how big of a task will it be? And then in other words, how difficult is it going to be? Which hopefully will give you some idea of how much effort there will be and how much it will cost, if anything. So that should be a primary question when you begin. Once you decide that you're not afraid to georeference, that it seems tractable, and that you have the resources needed, then you decide what methods are you going to use. Usually what you do is you begin with the, one of these guides and you look it through it and you decide what you agree with and what you don't agree with or you decide something specific for what you're doing that is in addition to those guides and you say, okay, I'll document that. We'll use those methods except in certain cases and in those cases, here's what you do. So we'll document what we do. Then you need to figure out, or maybe even before that, what resources are you going to use? Are you going to try to do everything with Google Earth or not? If it's not in Google Earth, what are you going to do? Are there maps that you'll need? Where are you going to get those? Are you going to do it yourself? Or are you going to hire somebody to do it? Or are you going to have students do it for you? And then, how are you going to train them? Because you took the one day course in georeferencing. Do you trust yourself to teach them the five-day course on georeferencing? Okay, so decide what, what resources you need. How are you going to learn what you don't know? And how are you going to teach, if somebody else is going to do it, what they need to know? And then finally, try to figure out how much effort that's going to be. How long is it going to take to do the georeferencing? There are some easy, rough estimates of how long it takes to georeference. And I'll show you some statistics a little later, very soon, about that. There are ways to know how long this is going to take. That's in a slightly different presentation, so let me switch over to it. Are there any questions about what is a georeference or why to georeference so far? While I go get that other one. 